This is a full recording of BBC Clicks interview with Peter Todd at the Bitcoin Squat in London. It was first broadcast on the 20th of September 2014. This recording was made by me, Chris Ellis, on the second day of filming and was only intended for personal use at the time. Since then, the BBC have released their full edits and the broadcaster has sparked a lot of controversy on social media as we felt the great deal of complexity in the subject matter had been left out due to BBC Click's show format. After notifying the BBC and with ample public discussion on the World Crypto Network, we decided to release the audio in full so you, the community, can decide on the complex subject matter and the BBC's editorial decision making. There is a transcript in the description below and please make your voice heard in the comments. I think within Bitcoin, there's a lot of people who want to kind of brush over the fact that from the point of view of someone investigating crime, it's very easy to use Bitcoin in ways that make it very hard to trace someone. And people like to get very pedantic and say, you know, Bitcoin's pseudo-anonymous, Bitcoin's anonymous. And, you know, I don't really think that that interesting of a debate. You know, Bitcoin is not a perfect technology, but no technology is. When you say perfect, not perfectly anonymous, then that's like... Yes, but then again, I mean, nothing is. I mean, any computer system you could imagine, you can always go screw it up and it turns out there's a drone flying by your window or something. You know, anonymity is always kind of a degree. And I think the important thing is that Bitcoin is orders of magnitude easier to use in ways that are untraceable. You know, if you're, say, someone with not that much money, of course, the reality is within the finance system, if you do have a lot of money, it's very easy to go set up shell companies, you know, manipulate the system to move money around in essentially untraceable ways. The system wasn't designed per se for that, or maybe it was. But the fact of the matter is, you can. And Bitcoin provides the same capability for people of more limited means. You know, which is, we always like to go save Bitcoin level the playing field. I mean, that's one thing that we're looking at with this document that's supporting me from ISIS with the dark wallet. I mean, what are your thoughts on that with ISIS using the dark wallet potentially as a tool to fund their activities? And I'm sure at some point they would. But, you know, on the other hand, I mean, we've seen ISIS and Taliban and all these organizations use some of the tools already. You know, they, the existing financial system is designed in a way that if you have large amounts of resources, you know, you can go use it to your advantage move money around and trace them. And I suspect, yeah, there is certainly political forces that would rather that stay, stay true. And equally, I mean, you know, it's always risk, risk and reward. You know, if ISIS goes and uses Bitcoin to go and get some funding, yeah, that's a negative. But what does Bitcoin also enable technology? You know, it's the usual thing. You know, we could go put cameras in every bathroom. But, you know, it's not worth it. I mean, if you knew directly about an ISIS group using the dark wallet, for example, or Bitcoin, what would you what would you do? Would you do anything to prevent something happening with that money? You know, dark wallet software. I mean, if I were to go do something to go and encourage the software to be changed, to catch them, the fact of the matter is I would be making dark wallet less safe for everyone. You know, there's no intermediate. You know, you go make things less safe for other people in the same way that, you know, if I were manufacturer of the box, would I go and say, you know what, let's just go and make this lock not actually work? Because, you know, we'll be able to bust in criminals' doors easier. Well, sure, then criminals can bust into other people's doors easier. You know, the way the world works is you're much better off if you give everyone tools to stay secure and you accept the fact that some criminals are going to use those same tools. But there's not that many criminals out there, and we've dealt with this problem for hundreds of years. But I guess some of the criminals now are becoming very extreme, and we're seeing much more movement towards people who can act almost in the same level as the state. They can develop their own military, they can develop, you know, get weapons, and some people might say the dark will facilitate. Well, I don't think there's anything unique. I mean, you know, you go back 50 years, did there exist guerrilla movements without anything digital? Well, sure. You know, there's always been criminals of various size and organization. You know, we've dealt with this problem. We know what society is up against, and we know the harm isn't that great. Whereas we know the harm of totalitarian governments is enormous. But might you say that the harm is similar because some groups like ISIS, for example, are acting like totalitarian governments? 
you know, between mass murder, oppression of women, is that something that would be useful to find? Is that something that you... Well, again, I think this gets back to the thing of Bitcoin does not change the status quo for well-funded adversaries. They already have access to them. And Bitcoin changes the status quo for not well-funded adversaries. And equally, not well-funded people who want to decide it. I mean, Bitcoin is an example. You know, Wikileaks depends on it. I certainly want Wikileaks to exist in society. I do not want it to be possible for the U.S. government to, as they tried, to have buffalo flow money to those groups. I mean, that's one thing we're going to look at is the Financial Action Task Force in Paris, the European Banking Authority, and also the Department of Defense in America are all looking at ways that Bitcoin is actually kind of a terrorist object. Yeah. Something that they can be happy to do about that. I think obviously terrorists will use it. And, you know, the benefits certainly outweigh the risks. And equally, obviously, terrorists will use the internet. Obviously, terrorists use freedom of speech. And we've accepted that that is a trade-off we must make. So what do you think, what do you think the Department of Defense will do? Is there anything that needs to be... Well, what they do is a very interesting question. I mean, I think this, you know, from my point of view, I see yeah, My role within Bitcoin certainly needs to include doing what I can to ensure that the technology depends against government actions trying to go and shut it down. Much the same way as the Twitter developers. You know, defend that technology against governments trying to shut it down. Currently, it's mostly being China, where they've tried to use, they've tried to go shut down Tor to go and keep dissidents from being able to go spread information. At some point, they'll break in the US as well. And they work very hard to ensure that the technology enables that. And, you know, part of that's working on the technology itself, part of that's the political landscape surrounding it. Some of, some of that involves um, both things simultaneously. The points are different. I mean, how important is liberty to you? Well, I mean, I think liberty is just being something we've accepted in Western style democracies for hundreds of years. You know, that's just, that's why the system works. If you don't have liberty, even with the best intentions, governments eventually slide towards corruption and totalitarianism. And you must have liberty as an opposing force to that. You know, you may not have liberty to the extent that everyone can own their own nuclear weapon, or even yeah. everyone can own a gun. It's something that's very contested. But there's degree, and by having balance, especially with growth of the freedom of speech, you know, the system works better. And you know, interesting with Bitcoin now, right now in the U.S., freedom of speech in terms of political donations has come up, and the Supreme Court's have very clearly ruled that money is speech. Well, from that point of view, Bitcoin is another way of preserving your freedom of speech by ensuring that you can go and give money to the causes you support. I think what's interesting, though, about, for instance, the IT situation and liberty in the context of Western democracy is it's actually the technology is going to be aiding very special groups. Yes. Part of Western democracy is acceptance that some part of the community may not have the same values as you. And you take the broader view of if you set up a system where you can oppress that community, you've really turned turned your back on your own values. Because part of our values is the acceptance that the rights exist. So if we came to a situation that, you know, I could get a nuclear weapon and they kind of attack America and well, something that could have been funded by Bitcoin, yeah. for example, is that worth it if you could have stopped it? Well, you know, again, you've got to ask, well, what's the side effect of stopping it? Again, you can always say, all right, we're going to put a camera in every bathroom to go stop that. Yeah, we probably would stop it. But what's, you know, what's the consequences? And, you know, frankly, I mean, even taking such an extreme example, you know, ISIS hypothetically having a nuclear weapon paid for by Bitcoins. The fact of the matter is, we've seen the results of nuclear weapons. And you know what? Hiroshima and Nagasaki still exist, and Japan is a thriving democracy. Like, the very worst case, we have historical precedents and we can understand that we can survive this and we can move on. Whereas countries that haven't been able to maintain their freedom, like Russia, well, what's happening in Russia? You know, they never really were able to transition to a proper democracy. And, you know, from Canada, there certainly are a lot of Russian immigrants in Canada. You know, that really says something. Well, <clears throat> 
think um, I mean, some people watching it, they they find it kind of extraordinary that you would say that, for example, the dark wallet was so important that you risk your home country saving unit or whatever. That that was an idea that. Well, freedom of speech is the same issue. I mean, heck, like, you know, my brother, he's actually going to be in Iraq in a couple weeks. He's deploying off as part of the country's air force. And, you know, I've talked to him about all this stuff, and if anything, in some ways, he's even more extreme than my position, because, of course, he is in the military. It's not ISIS, but we're going to bomb the shit out of them. You know, what does ISIS have on us? Why, why are we worrying about this? I guess, from, from my perspective, the woman just... Yeah. With ISIS, I do worry because I do think any like Taliban, you know, I do fear any kind of movement that is working to oppress women or doesn't recognize us as an equal You know, an interesting view on that, and I'm not really sure I agree with this view, but I think it's an interesting concept is that our military power is funded by our freedom of speech, our democracy, our economy that actually works. And you know, again, I'm. I don't quite necessarily agree with this, but even if you know you take those kind of views, well, ensuring that we still have a functioning democracy gives us the legitimacy to go up against something like ISIS. And from that point of view, again, you still need the self-criticism, you still need all this freedom of speech to enable us to have that moral superiority. I mean, I guess one thing people might say watching this just in the discussion about liberty is um, you guys have, we talked about this yesterday, but you guys have such a kind of vaulted position where you have this incredibly interesting technology um, that you control, basically, and that you could... We influence, we don't control it. People choose to use it. People might say, well, you could choose to step in and monitor what's happening. Right. Or what's well, the interesting it. thing is, I mean, it's always the cap of the bay. You know, once we write the software, we can't tell people by the way, we prefer it if you um, used it in this way that happens to go break your privacy. You know? I mean, I always see it as once, I mean, literally, once information is out there, people know how to use it. And the question is, well, what's the next step? And the next step for me is certainly, all right, let's go make it better. Make it more secure. Yeah. Because ultimately, more secure means that the majority of people who are good guys, if you will, they're, they're, they benefit more than anyone else. And, you know, in the balance of things, we're better off if we have grassroots ad- advocacy friends. How can you find that? Well, Bitcoin's one good way. You know, keep the playing field level. Are you ever tempted to use your kind of knowledge to use weight any kind of political war? Or no? Well, Dark Wall is an attempt to weight I mean, it's, you know, it's the constant battle of the moderate defenders of democracy is going to say, yes, we've got to go keep the system the way it is. And yeah, that's what's kind of interesting, but it's just, it's returning our environment back to the days when you could go and give someone cash. You know, we've got a lot of forces trying to completely up on cash. Well, what does that do? It means every single part of the economy can be monitored by governments. And we have ample evidence that that is just too much power. Um, I mean, I suppose, um, um, Well, that obviously works pretty well. 
then to go and let society push further down this avenue of less freedom. In the exact same way as Ford maintains the ability of people to go and talk, to spread their speech. Again, that's something we've had that's being clamped down on, and I'm not sure I ever see that maintained. And you're fine knowing that obviously people in the dark world are sure, but it might result in assassination plots, terrorism, drug deals. Of course I am. Yeah. You know, that's just part of society. I mean, we know how much harm those people do, and we know we can live with it because we've dealt with this. What we also know is that when you allow totalitarianism to happen, as you slide, you know, toward that, society does not have good way to deal with it. And very quickly countries that make that mistake, well, they wind up having a lot of people leave and move to Canada. <laughs> and you know, I mean it, it's like I, I come from Toronto where like easy I think the number is like 60% of the population comes from outside Toronto. And a lot of those people that I've personally met have come from very, very repressive governments. What do those governments do? They maintain controls on movement of capital, maintain controls on movement of information. I guess that's why the ISIS example is so pertinent to Bitcoin, because it's one thing like Bitcoin is such an idealistic thing, but it's another thing when you have a Another question would be, where did ISIS get their funding from originally? Yeah. So could we talk about that yeah. as well? That's really cool. I like people like that. I like people like that. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. It's really Yeah. <laughs> 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 